We are getting ready to start um, session three, exploring models of CCDS. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Longo. I don't believe Dr. Longo needs an introduction, uh, but uh, here it is anyway. Um, Dr. Longo is a professor of pediatrics and adjunct professor of pathology, nutrition, and integrative physiology at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Um, he has a long-standing interest in um, membrane transporters for which he has worked on amino acid, glucose, carnitine, and creatine transporters. He follows several patients with brain creatine deficiency and has an active interest in developing new methods to facilitate their detection by screening, improving existing therapies, and developing new ones for, for these conditions. Many of you have interacted with uh, Dr. Longo either prior to or during this conference, um, and very excited to hear from um, Dr. Longo about his work on small molecule therapy for GAMT deficiency. Um, I briefly want to highlight that um, ACD was happy to um, fund this effort in part um, uh, through the Holiday Heroes fundraising effort that we did. Um, so thank you, Dr. Longo, for all your efforts and looking forward to hearing about the update. Thank you, Sanjita, for the nice introduction. And uh, what I will talk today is the effort that are underway to develop new molecules to inhibit the synthesis of guanidinoacetate. And, uh, and to do so, I'm going to explain to do one more time, you have heard that already a few times, how uh, guanidinoacetate and creatine are synthesized and how do we identify in inhibitors of uh, arginine to glycine amidinotransferase. You see that you start from arginine and glycine to synthesize guanidino acetate and ornithin. And what we know in GAMP deficiency is that the deficiency of creatine is a problem, but the second problem is the excess of guanidino acetate that can be toxic for uh, nerve cells. How do we do in reducing the synthesis of guanidino acetate. We have a therapy, so first of all, we are missing creatine, and we give creatine supplements. And this obviously restores the creatine level in the brain. At the same time, we limit the intake of protein to reduce the synthesis of arginine, which is one of the precursors of GAM, of guanidino acetate. We give ornithine to provide a feedback inhibition of the enzyme and sodium benzoate to remove a little bit of glycine. And also we try to reduce the activity of the agate enzyme. There are possible therapy, including the development of chaperone for patients who have missense mutation, possibly gene therapy, and gene editing. Thank you. Now, what would be the ideal goal? Obviously, the ideal goal would be to totally remove the activity of this enzyme, which is the agar. And you have already heard about the effort that are underway in the laboratory of Dr. Schulze to reduce completely the expression of this gene. So at the same time, if we had a direct inhibitor of this enzyme, even if some enzyme were made, we would completely block the synthesis of guanidino acetate. Now, how do we do that? So normally, guanidino acetate is mostly synthesized in the kidney, inside mitochondria, inside the kidney cell, and then it is transported into the liver, where it is converted into creatine, and then creatine is uh, exported to all organ and to the brain by the action of the creatine transporter. What we try to do, we try to inhibit the enzyme, which is a gas. The first step, you have seen uh, a lot of uh, sequences, and uh, they usually 
enzymes are synthesized in the cytoplasm and they are directed where they work by leader sequences that put a tag on them and direct them in this specific case to mitochondria. The problem we had is that we started cloning the enzyme and purifying it, we had to remove the tag that directs them to mitochondria to get an enzyme which is more soluble and easier to study. One has to keep in mind that physiologically, this tag is removed when the enzyme enters inside mitochondria. So basically, we are getting the active enzyme to study in order to be able to see how we can inhibit it. And then once we have done that, what we have to do, we have to de de devise a system of purification and we devised different system by which we were able to attach the enzyme to a colon and then elute it almost in a pure fraction. And this was done by Bijina, who is a postdoc in our laboratory. And then we had to, st to study the reaction. In the reaction of this enzyme, we incubate the enzyme with arginine and glycine, which is the natural precursor, and we obtain the formation of ornithine and guanidino acetate, and we could measure them in the laboratory by measure both the amino acid and the guanidino acetate, and you can see that the enzyme physiologically produced equal amount of ornithine and guanidino acid. At this point, we were able to screen the enzyme with possible inhibitors. The inhibitors were designed by Atomwise, which is a company that conducted a virtual screening of uh, millions of molecules to identify possible inhibitors. And what they did, they targeted the area which binds the uh, substrate to generate guanidino acetate and ornithine. The way that we did, we incubated compounds with the enzyme, ornithine and glycine, uh, sorry, uh, uh, arginine and glycine, and uh, in 96 well plate, including positive and negative controls. And what we obtain, we obtain that some enzyme were able to decrease the synthesis of guanidino acetate. This is just guanidino acetate in micromolar, and you can see that you know when you have no bar, basically that's a good inhibitor, and when you have a high bar, that it is a bad inhibitor. We focus on the one that inhibited more than 25% of the enzyme activity, and then we did a second round to try to figure out how they did. And these are the compounds that were actually identified by this screen. So these are molecules created in the lab that are able to inhibit the activity of the enzyme. This is the very first round, so we did not expect any compound to be extremely effective, but we expected some of them to be effective. And all of the compounds share some of the arginine backbone. This is not surprising because obviously these were created by tagging the active site of the enzyme. And when you do a quantitative analysis, you have that some of them actually are able to inhibit the synthesis of guanidino acetate with still very high concentration. We aim to micromolar concentration. But at the same time, they are the starting point in designing new compounds. Now that we have them, we are going back to the drawing board, trying to ins insert all of these chemicals inside the crystal structure of the agate enzyme to see how we can modify some of the structure to make, make compounds that are even more efficient in inhibiting this enzyme. In this way, we should be able to uh, substitute some of the current therapy for agate deficiency with something which is smaller, given in lesser amount, and at the same time, capable of inhibiting the synthesis of guanidino acid. So in summary, 
GAM deficiency impairs creatine synthesis and result in guanidino acetate accumulation. Therapy with creatine administration is very effective in agate deficiency that I didn't discuss today, while suppression of GAA synthesis is also necessary in GAM deficiency. Inhibition of agate could decrease synthesis of guanidino acetate restoring normal levels of these compounds in the brain. An inhibition of agate, together with creatine supplement, could greatly improve the outcome of patients with GAM deficiency. Initial hits share uh, uh, the arginine backbone and are being optimized to obtain more powerful inhibitor. And I want to thank all of the people who worked on this project, Dr. Kent Lai and Dr. Bijina Balakrishnan in uh, the laboratory, Dr. Marcia Pasquale and Dr. Ingolias ARUP laboratory, and Dr. Neil Henriksen at Atom White, who will be synthesizing the new compound. Finally, I want to thank the Association for Creatine Deficiency, all patients and their family that are continuous stimulus for progressing in this study. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Longo. Um, we'll bring you up, back up for questions at the end of the session. Um, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Matthew, Matthew Skelton, um, um, to, in, to bring up his slides and his talk. Um, a brief bit about Dr. Skelton. Um, he's been involved in creatine research for over a decade. He, he was one of the first um, to develop a mouse model for C of CTD. Um, and the results from this first model of CTD were published in 2011. Subsequently, Dr. Skelton has continued to work with several different types of mouse models associated not just with CTD, but other CCDS um, disorders uh, in order to better understand the role of creatine in the brain um, and to understand how we might um, utilize mouse models to further our research. Um, Dr. Skelton has been an integral member of, um, of our association from the get-go. He, um, he serves on the Scientific Medical Advisory Board um, and also as a member of the Gene Therapy Consortium. I neglected to mention, but Dr. Longo uh, also participates in similar capacity. Um, I am really excited to hear from uh, Dr. Skelton today about his results with uh, a new mouse model, the P544L mutant mouse. Thank you. Um, sorry. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, quite humbled by it. And um, so we'll go ahead and get started on talking about um, mice with a point mutation in the uh, creatine transporter gene, having reduced brain creatine, spatial learning deficits, and impaired nest building. So I'm not going to belabor the creatine phosphate creatine pathway since we've had it all morning. Um, and I also would like to thank the rest of the speakers for really giving a good, solid background on why this research is needed, why we need these new models and um, different models of CTD. Um, so a little bit about the uh, SLC6A8P544L mouse. Uh, it was developed by Janana, uh, by uh, Drs. Blanchett and Gaetjen at uh, uh, Janana, and um, donated to us um, as they um, ended the project that they were working on. Um, it basically harbors a mutation that trans, uh, um, that makes the proline into a leucine at that 544 site. Um, and this is a mutation that is observed in some CTD patients. Um, our earlier knockout models, my model and Dr. Brancelli's model, have large segments of the DNA removed. So in mine, it was two through four, exons two through four, and theirs, it's exons five through seven, which results in a complete loss of protein, but may, may not be an excellent model for specific point mutations. So there's, uh, this is an important next step in that is where we start identifying uh, maybe a different model that we can test um, some of the compounds that were talked about this morning, in fact. Um, and so the big question that we had was, is this model sufficient to recapitulate some of the learning and memory deficits that have been seen in the large deletion models that are a high fidelity model of CTD? So the goal of this work was to determine if these learning memory deficits were present. Um, 
So as far as our experimental design, we'll go through this fairly quickly. We used wild type and um, knock-in, so the P554, we'll refer to knockout for the rest of the talk. Um, it was generated by wild type to heterozygous matings. We only used one knockout and wild type mouse per litter. This is important in experimental design studies, um, just to make sure that you're avoiding any other things that can be inherited from the parents. Um, so you get a better representation of the gene that you're really interested in. Uh, we tested the mice in a, wild variety, in a wide variety of behaviors, looking at things like working memory, spatial learning, and memory, which is a declarative form of memory, so that's the, you know, remembering person, people, places, and things. Um, object recognition, emotional memory using condition and contextual fear. We measured a relatively new behavior to our lab of nest building, and then we also looked at home cage activity where we just measured how much the animal moves within their cage. We also weighed the animals and measured the brain creatine levels. So this is the uh, data with the body weight and creatine levels. And you can see that the mice, um, if you look over here first, let's see if I can get this laser here. Yeah, so if you look on this side first, you can see that the mice, the knockout mice weigh less than their wild type counterparts. This is pretty consistent with every model of uh, creatine transporter knockout mice is that you have this body weight reduction that, um, based on our previous data, is likely due to uh, hypotonia, a loss of muscle tissue in the mice. And when we measure brain creatine levels in the first behavioral cohort, we have a significant re reduction in brain creatine levels as well. So we have um, the, the sort of physical hallmarks of our previous models. So then we measured spontaneous alternation. This is a form of working memory. And in this test, the mouse starts in one arm of the Y maze and is allowed to freely move around so the walls are removed. They're allowed to freely move around each uh, wall or each arm of the maze. The idea is that a mouse will not visit an arm that they visited previously. So they're going to go into each arm as they go through. So if the spontaneous alternation would be they start here, they go here, they quit shaking on that arm, and then they go into that arm. So that's one alternation. And then ideally they'll go back here, 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 and they can reverse it, and each one of those is considered a successful trial. So we let them do this for eight minutes, and we measure the number of times that they go A, B, C, C, B, A, B, C, A, as long as they don't repeat B, A, B, that's a failure. So there's no difference in this, so this is a measure of working memory because it's just a transient uh, sort of, uh, of memory. And there's no difference between the wild type and the knockout in this, which is a little bit different than um, some of the earlier models that show this deficit. Um, but there's a reduction in the number of open arm in total entries in the knockout mice, uh, which can be indicative of um, lower spontaneous activity. So from there, we, we went into the Morris water maze, which is a measurement of um, spontaneous or uh, spatial learning and memory. So in this task, which I've discussed probably five times now. We um, fill a pool with water, hide a platform right there, drop the mouse in the corner, and ask them to swim around and find the platform. We give them four trials a day, and then we test them for four days. And as you can see, the distance that they travel is, gets better as time goes on, both across wild type and knockouts. Similar to other models, they are slower, so we use distance instead of speed. So since the mice swim slower, we're not going to ask them to find the platform as fast. So when you look at the wild type and knockouts, when you compare the two, there's a significant main effect of gene on the distance that it takes to find the platform with the knockout mice taking, uh, traveling a greater distance to the platform. So after these four days, we play a little nasty trick on them and we take the platform out. We put them in there and we ask them to swim around for a minute. And we measure the number of times that they cross where the platform used to be, and how much time they spend in the quadrant where the platform was, and how, much dis how far they are away from the platform on average. We call that a probe trial, which measures memory. Uh, the wild type and knockout mice performed similarly in this test during the acquisition phase. Well, when, just when they thought we were done messing with them, we actually take the platform and we move it over here. So this is the bottom representation. This is called a rever reversal trials. Again, same thing, four trials a day for four days. Put the animal in and ask them to find the new, space, the new hidden platform. So if you notice the axis, this is actually a more difficult task. So the top is 10 here, 15 here. Um, and you don't see a great improvement across days. But you do notice that the knockout mice do take a, uh, travel a longer path to the platform compared with the wild type. 
And in the probe trials, we do have fewer platform crossings in the knockout mice compared with the wild type, suggesting a, a spatial memory deficit as well. So in comparing these to our previous, or our other knockout model, our large knockout uh, exons two through four, we actually have a pretty good match across these. So we need to add a few more mice to these animals down here just to, uh, to increase the power of this study. But we can see that the spatial learning deficits are pretty similar between our large knockout mouse and our point mutation mouse. So that's a pretty encouraging sign. Um, so next we go to novel object recognition. And in this task, we put the animals in an arena. We let them acclimate to the arena for a couple of days. And then on the test day, we present them with four identical objects. We let them explore the chamber for 10 minutes, getting an idea of what these objects are. After an hour, we take them out. And then an hour later, we put them in with three identical objects. Now, these are three completely new objects, though. So we have seven of these and so that we don't have scent cues that are associated with the objects that they learned before. And then we switch one of the objects for some new type of objects that's different in shape, size, and generally in color. And we determine how long they spend with each one of those objects. So the definition of an investigation is they have to go to their nose, they have to put their nose to the object and, stay, and observe it. They climb on the object, we don't count that. And if they turn away from it, but they're still in that area, we don't count it. Uh, we calculate the percent time they spend with the novel object compared with the total time they spend observing all objects. There was no difference between the wild type and the knockout yet, even though I think that when we get more animals added to this, uh, group, these groups that we may end up having some statistical significance there. One of the differences between that and some of our earlier studies is that we actually only used two objects before um, and switched the one. I think that the four object recognition task allows for greater reinforcement of the objects. So the memory is a little bit more ingrained, a little bit uh, uh, more reinforced. And the next thing that I'd actually like to do with these mice is just go back to the two object and see if we can replicate the deficits that we found. Um, so then again, this is the comparison. This is actually the, this, these data here are with a four object as well. Uh, but you can see that the deficits here are a little bit more robust. And actually, if we're going to pin it on something, we can pin it on the wild type mice not doing their job, not going and observing that object. Because if you look, they're only at about 35% whereas our wild type mice are right at 70%. And the knockout mice are pretty similar between the two groups. So um, this, again, goes into that importance of when I talked about before, you only want to take one mouse per litter because you never know what sort of effects the parents are going to have. These are two completely different strains of mice in a lot of ways. They're both on the same background, but these have been bred to, you know, within their little cohort for quite a while, as have these. So there are little differences that we have to be aware of that we need to control for. Um, the next thing we test them for is this context contextual and cued freezing. This is an emotional memory that's tied to the amygdala. This test here, we put the animals in a sound attenuated box with a grid floor. We let them hang out there for about six minutes. And then we play a tone. And at the end of that tone, we play that tone for five seconds. The last two seconds of that tone, we shock them. And we repeat this four times. One day later, we put them back in that box for six minutes. On the third day, so then we take them out again, and on day three, we change the floor, we change the walls, we let them acclimate to that for three minutes, and then we play the tone continuously for three minutes. If an animal remembers what happened to them on day one, they're going to freeze in response to the context in which it happened or into the unconditioned stimulus to the condition stimulus in which it happened, which is the tone. When we place them in the context, you can see that the wild type animals freeze at about 25%. The knockout animals are at about 20. So we're getting to the point where you know, there's a small difference there. Um, and with more animals, we may be able to pull something out. But with on day three, you can see that there is a difference between the wild type and the knockout animals, with the knockout animals not recalling the tone as well as the wild type animals do. So this, again, we're getting at a different part of the brain, a different um, different behaviors so that, again, all these are important because we want to make sure that we um, can test a variety of different outcomes so that when we do go to treatment, we have different um, avenues that we can explore. And then again, here's the difference between the uh, point mutation mice here and then our um, large knockout mice here. This is from, I 
think one of the first papers that we published, and you can see that there's a large contextual freezing here. So this is time freezing instead of percent, but you can still see the big difference between the wild types and the knockouts, and same here in the, con uh, the contextual, we have this. Um, so again, this is just important so that we know what we're looking at um, when it comes to each model. Okay, so that's enough bar graphs, right? So let's show some pictures. Um, this is a relatively new assay that we've taken into the lab, and this is uh, nest building. This is actually used as a model for, or as a test that's used in Alzheimer's disease. So most people, you think of nest building, and sort of when I thought about it, it was self-care and how does an animal uh, navigate, but it turns out that when you do hippocampal lesions, and the hippocampus is an important area for declarative memory. So that spatial learning that I showed, that originates in the hippocampus. This is another uh, measure, a way of measuring hippocampal function. So I'm gonna point out this guy right here. This is actually what the test looks like when we start. We take five nestlets and we drop it in the mouse's cage. We house all the mice individually for this. So they actually come out of the um, contextual fear paradigm and we house them individually for the next two tests. This is what it looks like. But this is 24 hours after we put those nestlets in there. This is 24 hours after we put the nestlets in in the wild type mouse. All the mice on the bottom are knockouts. All the mice on the bottom, on the top are wild type. So you can see good nest building in the wild type mice here where they've shredded most of the nestlet, a little bit there, um, and made a, basically a little cone that they can sleep in. Now there are, some, there are uh, there's a scoring system that we use for this, but I didn't want to present another bar graph, so I showed you the pictures instead because I think they do um, this effect justice. And you can see in our knockout mice, this guy didn't touch his nestlets at all. Um, and these are all litter mates. So this guy's, these are brothers, these are brothers, these are brothers, these are brothers. And you can see varying degrees of really poor nest building ability in these mice, which again reinforces that spatial learning deficit, that this really is a hippocampally mediated deficit. And so the final test that we did was looking at home cage activity. And this has a couple of different things, is that we can measure the overall activity of the mice, but we can also look at circadian rhythms to see if they have disrupted circadian rhythms. The cages that we did the nest building in, we just took those cages and we put um, photo beams around them, measured the overall activity for 72 hours. The shaded areas are the uh, dark phases. So they go up at 14 hours of light, 10 hours of dark. And you can see that there's a trend towards hypoactivity in the knockout mice, which we sort of saw with the Y maze, is that the animals just don't move around as much. But there's really no disruption in their circadian rhythm. You don't see where they've shifted into being hyperactive in the light when they weren't in the dark or their activity shoots much higher than the, not, than the wild types do when the lights go off, um, indicating the circadian rhythms are intact, but there might be just a little bit of a reduction in activity. In these last two tests, we actually haven't tested our large knockouts in yet, so I don't have any comparisons between the two. Uh, so for summary and conclusions, uh, the P544L mice, we'll call them PL mice as well, um, have reduced brain and creatin levels and uh, lower body weights. They have deficits in spatial learning and memory. Uh, object memory, I put as spared because it didn't reach statistical significance. I think with a little bit more uh, work, we can really determine whether it is or not. Uh, emotional memory looks like it's affected, but again, we need to up the mice. We, there's about 11 mice in each group of these. We like to get to 16. We should have that at the end of the summer, and we're hoping to have this paper published very soon. Um, and then together it shows that these mice um, have neurologic deficits and it makes them a good model for the treatment of um, CTD that may be related to protein repair or um, the chaperoning type of things that we learned about this morning. And with that acknowledgement, uh, my lab, uh, Marla Perna and Rosalind Liu, who uh, graduated from my lab, is now a med student at the University of Toledo. Aaron Williams was an undergrad that helped with the creatine assays and now he's a medical student at the University of Cincinnati. The Animal Behavioral Corps, Chip Voorhees, uh, Michael Williams, and Adam, the main technician in there. Division of Neurology, it shows Cincinnati Children's, the ACD, and NINDS for support. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Skelton. Uh, next up, um, our speaker is virtual. Uh, while we get ready for her talk, uh, I just wanted to make a quick announcement about a schedule change. Uh, following this speaker, we will go into a Q&A session. After that, we will have a, um, a talk by 
Carol Chehova of Extraordinaire prior to entering our uh, clinical trial discussion panel. Okay, now to get to the, um, the talk um, right now. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Hong Ru Chen. She is an assistant professor um, in the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Um, her research primarily focuses on investigating um, neurons and monocyte-derived pathological microglia and how these interact to mediate neuro neural physiology and behavior in different conditions. Um, specifically, her talk today is going to um, focus on how creatine transporter deficiency affects brain energetics in murine models. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chen, are you able to hear us? Uh, yes. Excellent. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine and we see your slide as well. Thank you. Okay. All right, so hello everyone, I'm Hong Ru. So thanks for the kind of introduction. And the title of my talk today is Creating Transporter Deficiency Impairs Stress Adaption and the Brain Energetics Homeostasis. So the content of my talk will be, first, I will introduce the brain energetics and the creatine deficient syndrome. And second, I will use the creatine transporter neuromice to determine the impacts of creatine and phosphocreatine deficiency on cell signaling and under stress. And here is the cerebral ischemia. And then third, I will develop the treatment of the neuropathological differences in creatine transporter deficiency. So according to the previous study, as we know, the brain is a high energy demand organs. For example, like human brain only represent 2% of body weight, but they use more than 20% oxygen usage. Additionally, the brain also has the third highest concentration of the creatine in the body, which the first is a skeletal muscle and the second is the heart. So suggesting the importance of the ATP and phosphocreatine system for ATP repression, which is much faster than glycolysis and the mitochondrial respiration. Also, um, phosphocreatine is smaller than ATP, so the brain has four, 10 fold higher concentration of phosphocreatine than ATP. So that's why a lot of study already demonstrate that the creatine and phosphocreatine can provide intermediate repression of ATP to conduct the neuron protection in multiple neurodegenerative disease. So how the creatine synthesis and the metabolism? So as we know, there are two major creatine synthesis enzymes. One is the amyotransferase, the AGAT in the kidney, and the other is the transmethylase GAMT in the liver. So approximately 50% of the creatine is from de novo synthesis from the body, and another 50% is from daily food. So once the creatine, so all the creatine need a uh, specific protein, which is called a creatine transporter to get into the brain. So what will happen if the creatine transporter was disrupted? So typically we know the creatine def uh, deficiency syndrome will cause the behavior disorders, seizure and intellectual, intellectual disability and some speech delay, and also cause some movement disorders. So one of the major reasons is due to the creatine synthesis enzyme differences, the AGAT and the GAMT mutation, which are the rare disease. And another one is due to the creatine transporter mutation which is the second highest cause of the s link intellectual disability. So our cooperator, Tang Degru, who was the first one to identify the creatine transporter mutation in the clinic. So by using the MRS analysis, as you can see here, for those creatine transporter mutation patients, you can see the obviously reduce of the creatine in the brain. So for those creatine synthesis enzyme deficiency patients, the response to the oral creatine supplement therapy. But for those creatine transporter mutation patients, they do not respond to the oral creatine supplement well. So that's why the important thing is that we have to develop the effective therapeutic method for this major neural development deficits. So for this purpose, we generate a creatine transporter neuromice. So in this creatine transporter neuromice, 
we really find that it can cause the dendritic spine and the synapse genesis. For example, like it will reduce the spine intensity in the creatine transporter neural mice. And also he will change the spine shape from mushroom to thin shape. So by generating these mice, then we further apply this creatine transporter neural mice to test our hypothesis that whether creatine and phosphor creatine can maintain the ATP levels and modulate the MPK, mTOR autophagy pathway in the brain. So once the creatine deficiency syndrome happens, it will increase the ATP and ADP and AMP levels and we will further activate the AMPK signaling pathway to induce the autophagy. Meanwhile, it will also inhibit the mTOR signaling pathway which is very important for the neural survival and functions. So then we challenge the creatine transporter neural mice and the wild timers with the stress, which is the cerebral ischemia. And as you can see here, after we challenge the wild type mice and the creatine transporter neural mice with the cerebral ischemia, then we collect the brain to detect the ATP level by the LC mass. As you can see here, after challenge with the cerebral ischemia, for the creatine transporter neural mice, you can see the obviously reduction of the ATP level in the epithelial sign. Also, it will also cause the autophagy and the mTOR signaling pathway differences. And if we look at the brain infra size, as you can see here, for the creatine transporter neural mice compared to the wild type, wild type mice, after change with the cerebral ischemia, we can see the obviously increase of the brain infra size. And also according to pre previous study, we already know that the oral feeding of the creatine uptake, it probably take a 15 days to elevate the brain creatine levels back to normal. So um, this is kind of slow kinetic of a creatine recovery in the brain when we use the GMT neural mice to uh, see the cr brain creatine level increase, so via such oral supplement. So to overcome these issues, we conduct the intranasal creatine delivery. So because the intranasal creatine, intranasal delivery can bypass the blood brain barrier, so it can quickly get into the brain. So uh, by doing this way, then we uh, challenge the creatine transporter neural mice with the cerebral ischemia and then do the intranasal creatine delivery. After 24 hours, we collect the brain and use the MRS analysis to detect the creatine levels in the brain. So as you can see here, both in the control letter side and in the IPC letter side, after intranasal creatine delivery for 24 hours, we can see the obviously increase of the creatine levels in the brain, both in the damaged side and the undamaged side. So if we further look at the brain infra size after intranasal creatine delivery, both in the wild type and the, in the creatine transporter neural mice, as you can see here, after intranasal creatine delivery to bypass the BBB, we really can see the brain infra size was reduced, both in the wild type and the creatine transporter neural mice. So suggesting that creatine transporter mice may highly express on the blood brain barrier. So to answer these questions, we use the creatine transporter heat ligus mice, which we insert a lazy cassette into a knockout allele. So by using a lazy antibody, we can detect the creatine transporter location. So by using the electron microscope, then we use the lazy antibody to detect the creatine transporter location. As you can see here, the creatine transporter is really highly expressed on the blood vessel. So this is further uh, support our hypothesis that intranasal creatine delivery can bypass the BBB and quickly get into the brain. Additionally, we also do conduct the in, in vitro creatine uptake assay. So by culture, the primary culture neurons, then we add the creatine into the culture median and after culture for 24 hours, we harvest the cells to detect the intracellular creatine levels. So as you can see here, both in the wild type 
creatine transporter or in the creatine transporter neural mice, we can see the obviously increase of the intracellular creatine levels. Also, uh, when we do the intranasal creatine delivery, it also can rescue the blood, uh, cerebral blood, blood flow, as you can see here, and also collect the autophagy and mTOR signaling pathway differences. Additionally, uh, when we apply the creatine transporter neural mice to the in vitro hypoxia ischemia, we also can see the creatine transporter deficient mice will produce great mitochondria reactive oxygen species and also will reduce the viability after intranasal hypoxia ischemia challenge. So, in summary, that we think the creatine transporter since highly expressed on the blood brain barrier, especially highly expressed on the vessel. So when the creatine transporter dis was disrupted, you will cause the mitochondrial dysfunctions, and we also cause the autophagy and mTOR signaling pathway differences, and we also impair the stress adaption. So when we do the intranasal creatine delivery, it can bypass the BBB, so it can quickly get into the brain to rescue the phenomenon. So in the end, I'd like to thank all the Quan Lab member and especially for two of our cooperator, the Tang Di Guru in Emory University and Diana in Cincinnati Children Hospital. So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Um, can I please invite Dr. Skelton and Dr. Longo to please come up on stage? Uh, I'd also like to invite our moderator, um, Dr. Jerry Lipschitz. Jerry, please feel free to introduce yourself. I'm Jerry Lipschutz, I'm from UCLA. I primarily work on uh, GAMP deficiency. Nice to see you all this afternoon. So just to, in my brief summary of the, of the talks, uh, Dr. Longo spoke about small molecule inhibitors of AGAT to uh, decrease GAA, which would help with GAMP deficiency. Dr. Skelton spoke to us about a mouse model that was developed with a uh, mutation that exists in people that would be more amenable to therapeutic testing than one that has a very large deletion like the one he originally developed and made some comparisons for us there. And then uh, Dr. Chen spoke to us primarily about uh, intranasal administration of creatine uh, that reduced infarct size and had other changes in SLC6A8 uh, mutated mice. So I, I thought I would just ask a, a few questions of, of each presenter and then uh, uh, open the questions to the to the uh, to the group here. And uh, starting with with Dr. Longo, how do you um, foresee maybe one of these inhibitors being administered to patients, like as an oral administration? Yes, all of these uh, uh, drugs should be available orally, and obviously they would be selected for their capacity to penetrate the brain very well, because otherwise they would not be effective. So the synthesis of guanidino acetate needs to be inhibited in all cells of the body, but especially in the brain where it is produced and it is definitely toxic. So that, in fact, happened to be my, my next question was about brain injury. So um, do you think that it will be feasible to come up with such a chemical that could cross the blood-brain barrier? Uh, so many times it is difficult to come up with a chemical that cross the blood-brain barrier. However, the selection process that they have at atom-wise usually favor molecules that are very hydrophilic, and they can actually go a, a, a long way. In most cases, these molecules are transported by 
many uh, uh, of the existing transporter, multi amino acid transporter, and they, uh, you know, obviously would use, uh, they would follow the path normally followed by physiological substances. Now, when we will get there, I do not know yet. That it is my big question, because obviously it is a trial and error. So now we know which molecule to put on the backbone, how to, uh, what we need to do is really understanding how this molecule fit in the overall structure of the, that we, that we know of, the crystal structure of the enzyme, to be able to extend them in a way to make them more specific and uh, uh, effective. So the key components really be hydro, hy hydrophilic molecules, not hydrophobic, so they're dissolved well in the plasma. Uh, Correct. So, and also, uh, they might be recognized by endogenous transporter. That would be the idea. Now, uh, uh, can we get there? I do not know. And the second thing, obviously, we have to check for toxicity. We don't want a molecule that it is very effective, but, you know, it's very toxic. We want something that it is effective and non-toxic. We have screened already available FDA-approved drugs, and we couldn't find anything reliable there. Thank you, thank you for your insight. Um, to, uh, to Dr. Skelton, um, I picked up on it a little bit, but the, of the mouse model that you developed 10 years ago or so with the uh, two, exons two to four deletion, and then this mo model developed by this company, are they comparable then in the phenotype then that you studied, the behavioral phenotype? I, I would say that they are. I would say that um, the the newer mutation is a milder form of it, so you don't see like the object recognition deficits, um, and some of the condition fear deficits weren't as strong. But I do think that it's that they're comparable and that they they show deficits and that that they could be amenable to to testing treatments and things like that. Um, but yeah, I would say that they're. Um, if you really wanted to get at the biology of the disorder, if you're really into the mechanisms, that you would go through the two through four mouse, but that this mouse has a role in, um, in other aspects of the disorder. Thank you, and for the audience and, and for me, do the female carriers have a phenotype in general of these models? So we did publish with the two through four uh, model, we published, um, it's been almost 10 years ago now that uh, the female carriers do have a very mild phenotype. Um, they show deficits during that first phase of the Morris maze, but not during the second. They didn't show object recognition deficits or conditioned fear. So it's a very mild phenotype. Um, and we haven't tested the, the heterozygous females in the, in the P554L yet because we wanted to make sure that the males had that deficit. So if we're putting our resources into it, we want to make sure that the males are a really good model, and then we'll go back and test the females um, to see how they do. Um, you know, one of the things with it being X-linked is we're sort of hesitant to test females because we're afraid that the model's not going to recapitulate the human model as well because of X inactivation and the mystery that it is. Is there a big difference in X inactivation between mice and man? We don't know. So, the, you know, the initial heterozygous females that we developed do appear to be a nice gene dose model and that they have about 50% of the creatine about 50% of the SLC6A8 expression, um, and they have the deficits, but we have to make sure really that we want to go after that female phenotype by making sure the male phenotype is strong first. Yes, makes, makes complete sense. Thank you, thank you. And then to Dr. Chen, can you, can you hear me okay? Okay, so yes. I, was, I was curious about something and maybe it in part relates to what Dr. Longo was speaking about in, in, in his area, unless I'm confused here. So you, you talked to us about intranasal creatine. I have a couple of questions, but I'll ask just the first one to begin with. How did you physically do that on, on mice? Like, what was the methods that you did this? You didn't have an inhaler, you probably used some kind of syringe and injected into their nostrils. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about physically how you did this? So actually, we just used the P10 pipette. Okay. So like a repeat it to infuse the creatine stuck a, into yeah. the nasal. nasal. Yeah. On awake yeah. mice, probably restrained in some way. Uh, actually, actually, we use like it, the mice, so we can repeat it to infuse the creatine into the mice. Uh, they were awake, though not anesthetized. Is that right? 
yes. awake. And so I was curious with this in the sense that you mentioned about crossing the blood-brain barrier quite easily, or at least crossing the blood-brain barrier by this route of administration, C correct? Uh, yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, because I had not uh, heard this concept before of crossing the blood-brain barrier through intranasal administration. I'm just curious in some way if, with Dr. Longo's thoughts with regards to your compounds, would there, this, is this poss a possibility here of intranasal administration then? Yes, obviously anything that can go in intranasally would be applied here. Now, what is the challenge of intranasal administration? The amount that you can give is limited. The nice thing of a drug such as the one that we are developing, we hope that you need very small amount of them. And the second thing, we hope that the half-life is long enough not to require multiple daily administration. With that would be the ideal situation. Now, uh, since I don't have a compound, I cannot tell you, but uh, that would be the goal. I mean, getting something that you can give possibly once a day and would be effective for at least 24 hours. Okay, thank you, thank you. Then a final question for Dr. Chen. Um, yeah. How did you inter induce the brain infarcts? Uh, were you tying off the carotid artery, a branch of it? How was your, what was your method for doing uh, that? You mean the cerebral ischemia models, right? Cerebral ischemia, right? yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used the photothrombotic stroke. So actually, we just inject the photosensitive dye, those banco, into the vessel, the, the MCA area, and then we shine the laser on that location so it can form a clot. So we use the photothrombosis stroke models. Photothrombosis stroke model, okay. Yeah, to induce the cerebral ischemia, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. So that's the extent of my questions I wanted to ask the speakers. If, did you have a comment, Dr. Long? I have a, I have a question for Dr. Chen, but in a person who is having a regular stroke, do you think that creating supplement could potentially help as well? Uh, actually, the purpose of we, uh, why we want to use this stress condition is because in our study, we find only in the creatine transported neuromice under stress, the brain ATP level will drop a lot. And our purpose is want to know the creatine and phosphocreatine, how to like a uh, interest to regulate the ATP levels in the brain to conduct the ATP repressment mechanism. So that's why we have to uh, give the creatine transport neuromice some stress. But actually, we also did some like a best night study. Um, we also see some very familiar results, but we still like a pro pro progress rate. Yeah. I, I also. No, please go ahead, please. I just also have a question for Dr. Chin. Um, yes. We've, we've heard talks today about all the variants of, of CCD and with the internasal, would this be effective on potentially on all variants then? Would it bypass the, the um, transporter completely? Uh, you mean whether intranasal creatine can exactly bypass the BB? That's what you asked. Sorry. Will it bypass the transporter since, since there's a hundred and some odd variants of the transporter? Um, will the internasal uh, treatment bypass those variants? Uh, I think in our, according to our study result, I believe so. But I think we need a more study to very carefully to verify that these questions. So I'll add to that just a little bit. Um, so when we design studies like that, when we do these big gene deletions, the idea that we're looking for is maximum effects. So we go exons two through four, exons five through seven, which is what Dr. Chin used, I believe. We want maximum effect. So we want to make sure that we really, you know, have the worst model of it that we possibly can, so to speak. Yeah. The theory being that if it works in a five through seven knockout or a two through four knockout, that it's going to have a high probability, which is about the best thing, the best way I can put that, of being successful in a different type of mutation, in a more subtle mutation. So when we go in there with a the sledgehammer, our purpose is to make sure that whatever we test can is going to get past a gene that's completely non-functional. 
So that was that's sort of the hope that we have. Now, there's no guarantees, obviously. There's no, but that's generally when you're designing models, that's what you do. That's why we go with, you know, I, I came from drugs of abuse. We went with the highest dose of methamphetamine that we could give a mouse or a rat to make sure that if we saw something, we could fix it. It was going to happen for the recreational meth user, too. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. you know, that's sort of where we sit as mouse modelers. So, so in in my creating transport model neural mice, we start to delete the the gene from exome five. So I think it's a, it's more like a neural mice. Yeah. I have a question for Dr. Longo. Um, so, Dr. Longo, um, the molecules that you're studying, they will the, the hope is that they will lead to a reduction in GAA levels. Um, if this were to be studied in a mouse model um, of GMT deficiency, apart from reductions in GAA levels, what are other things that you could you could measure to determine if the drug is working effectively? So obviously, what we monitor physiologically in patients with agarose deficiency during therapy are plasma amino acid, plasma guanidino acetate, and plasma creatine. I would monitor all of those parameters, but obviously, if we are giving the creatine, I would expect the creatine to remain elevated. I would expect the guanidino acetate to normalize, really to normalize, because, you know, if you take away the synthesis of guanidino acetate, like you see in patients with agate deficiency, with complete agate deficiency, the guanidino acetate is virtually almost zero. We, you don't eat much guanidino acetate inside the food. So if we could achieve that in an animal model, in addition to seeing an improvement in phenotype, that would be mission accomplished. My question's for Dr. Skelton. You talked about the X activation in the mice models for the female. I'm wondering, does that translate into humans as well? Is there a way to tell how much of the X activation versus inactivation is occurring in the patients? Um, so X inactivation is one of those million dollar questions, basically. It's, it's a very difficult, um, a difficult problem that's been dealt with in these X-linked disorders for a very long time. We don't have very good methods of determining which ones. And really, the mechanisms of how are still up for debate of, of why one neuron might express you know, this X and the other might express the other. Um, so no, we don't have a really great way to determine which ones are and which ones aren't. Because if we did, the thing that would be really great about being able to do that, if we could actually design experiments where we do gene, true gene dosage experiments in the females where we can turn on and off the X chromosome at will. That would be one of the best experiments we could design if we could ever design an experiment like that. It would be uh, really a wonderful set of experiments. Yeah. So um, in the study that we did, that was um, a former uh, undergraduate student in my lab wrote that paper. Her name's Emily Helm, and she's a, a assistant professor at the University of Michigan now. and. Um, what she did was measure the creatine levels in the brain. So we just took a hemisphere and we measured creatine levels using a standard creatine assay. And then we took the other half of the brain and measured uh, creatine transporter mRNA transcript. And in both of those, the, the expression level and the creatine level were about half. So we could garner from that that we were getting about half of the gene, half of the chromosomes were activated, half of them weren't. So, um, you know, without actually being able to go in and do like fish to look for uh, chromatin type of binding and things like that, which we could do. I mean, we're the we're, our, uh, pathology lab's the leading one in the state for that type of stuff. But um, without doing those, those are pretty good proxies for, for the uh, activation of those specific genes. I have studied a few cells of female patients who carry the abnormal, uh, the abnormal creatine transporter in the lab for creatine transport they were all normal. But it is a random process. And we see this in all X-linked disorder. You can have one tissue which is affected, one tissue that it is not affected. And within the same tissue, you can have five cells that are affected and three that are not, totally random. In some other diseases, I had twin uh, patients with an X-linked disorder. 
One of the twin was very sick, one of the twin was very mildly affected. It is totally random and it depends on the organ in which the right uh, uh, gene is expressed. If you inactivate most of the, uh, of the uh, bad gene in the liver, for example, probably doesn't cause much, but if that happens in the brain, then it is a different story. And you cannot predict that I know. Thank you so much. Um, that brings us to the end of our Q&A panel. Um, thank you, Dr. Longo, Dr. Skelton, Dr. Lipschutz for moderating, as well as Dr. Chen for joining in remotely. Um, really appreciate the participation. Um, moving on to our next session.